Welcome to another episode of the Dire Reserves Expert podcast. And I'm glad to, great to have a, a fantastic guy, a guy I know really well and I've worked with for a number of years on the podcast this week. Shares so many insights, so much value. I know you're going to love today. Uh, Mr. Robin Waite is with me. How are you, mate? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Join the sunshine, that's for sure. Well, this is it. This is it. So look, we're going to get into, uh, we're going to talk a lot of stuff today around sort of business and all the stuff that you love and you talk about and you coach and work with people on. But just for those that don't know you, tell people a bit about your story, because it's a fascinating story and how you got into doing what you do and you present it well at, uh, but tell me a bit more about, you know, your story now and what you do and, and actually how, yeah, you made a transition over the over the last, you know, 15 years or so to doing what you what you do. Yeah, so um, I mean, I, I always knew that I wanted to run a business. So um, out of school, I became a systems analyst as a bit of a summer job. And then after the summer, they decided they want to keep hold of me. So that was essentially um, uh, playing around with access databases, making uh, this manufacturing business that I worked for run more efficiently. And I ended up replacing, I think, about three people's jobs with the systems which I built. So uh, that was quite fun. I uh, did a degree at the same time as working for that company, which I ended up staying there for four years in total. Um, but kind of came to a bit of an acrimonious end because um, if essentially they were paying me student wages, but I was doing all this amazing work. The business had pretty much doubled in revenue. Um, it was doing really well. We'd actually sort of start, started to um, move more international. It was a medical devices company, so selling mostly in sort of the NHS originally, but then we started to go sort of into a lot more sort of European NHS um, uh, organizations as well. Um, so I ended up leaving because basically they didn't want to pay me anymore and I knew what my worth was even at that sort of tender age of sort of 21 I'll come back to that knowing what your worth is because I know that's a bit area you talk a lot about so (laughs) that's it absolutely so I one of the guys actually who ended up um who I worked with at that company we we ended up forming a marketing agency primarily doing sort of web design and branding uh this is way back in 2004 and, and you have to bear in mind that um 2004 probably doesn't sound like that long ago and even then the internet was 14 years old but we were still quite innovative in terms of what we were building in terms of websites for small businesses and things like that and the work we were doing for ourselves uh ran that for 12 years um eventually uh well initially i was just going to close it down in 2016 um and i was fortunate that somebody had spotted that i'd had a good sort of solid user base there we had some good recurring revenue coming in um so again that consistent revenue obviously is um is where a lot of value is created as well um but they they offered to buy me out for a a modest sort of fee which kept me going for a couple of years whilst i figured out what the next steps were um so kind of around about 2017 2018 i'm um I, I was doing a lot of informal mentoring with other agencies because they'd seen me grow and sell my agency. Um, and eventually I kind of had to decide on um, what it was that, you know, who did I want to serve? It's the usual sort of queries that you go through in any business. Uh, what is it you're selling? So for me, it was business coaching. Um, uh, and obviously I, I morphed into sort of the pricing product guy over a period of several years, created Fearless Business as a brand during that that process. And now we specialize in helping coaches, consultants, and freelancers to, first of all, productize their service. They're no longer charging hourly rates. And then um, from there, once they've packaged it up, get really confident around their pricing and learn how to articulate their value around it. And that's the bit, you know, I know you've, we've worked together on, on, on Shift Success and programs like that. And I know that's the bit when you, when I hear you speak, you're incredibly passionate about it. It's helping people, what we talk about, see their value and price what they're worth, really. And and obviously, we talk a lot about, we're talking a lot about sales elements in, in a moment. But uh, but actually, what's that feeling for you like when, when someone you work with who's previously charged, you know, a ridiculously low figure, then moves their number upwards and they get that figure for it? What's that feeling like for you personally when that happens? Yes, brilliant. I mean, the thing is, it's like it's like any skill which you learn that you can never unlearn. So, what, you know, you'll get this with your sales clients, for example, when they understand how to handle a specific objection. You know, they can they can never unlearn that, and you know that they're equipped with that skill for life. So, I know that once somebody learns to price properly in terms of you know not selling time for money anymore, but they're actually selling based on the results which they deliver for their clients instead. So, value based pricing. Um, the nice thing is, I know that when they when they've learned that they can put their prices up at any point in the future depending on where their level of confidence is at so uh, you know it, it 
does sometimes take some work to get people to that point because you're unpicking, you know, several decades worth in a lot of cases of sort of um, somebody's money story, their money mindset, their um, how they value themselves and all, all of the different, you know, bits of feedback which they've received, you know, about themselves in their in their lives. So, so yeah, it's it's, it's brilliant. It's really interesting, though, isn't it? Because we, you know, we, I know, you know, your book, which I encourage lots of people to read, uh, to read, take your shot, is a, is a really good example of that. As, and, and we actually does come into the sales environment where you know you go through in the book, and I oh, let people read the book, but it talks around a golf coach and the guy that basically sort of says, like, you know, what do you want to achieve when someone comes for lessons? And they're right. People don't want to play golf. They want when they turn up with their client at a, or a potential client on a golf course, and the client's really good at golf. They don't want to look a fool, do they? So the yeah. point is, it's like if that person can. Make Make that person look, you know, look, look decent on the golf course. We all have moments on a golf course where it's not great, but actually, they'll pay. Yeah, you know, what's that worth? The it's, it's incredible, isn't it? And it's that the psyche and approach that you talk about a lot, isn't it? In terms of your to doing things, it's it's like the ultimate value that something's worth is different to the price sometimes people pay. Yeah, that's it. Well, you know that anything that's sort of pricing uh, related is going to be based on emotions. Any any transaction, you know, whether it's B two B, business to business, or business to consumer, most ninety percent of that decision making process is going to be purely based on their feelings around trust and their knowledge of how much they understand what it is that they're actually buying and how long they've known the person for who's kind of sat across the the way from them um so you know and you 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 must get this all the time where if somebody's having a bad day they're always going to struggle to sell because that if they're emotionally in a in a you know down downtrodden sort of downset way or lack of com- lacking confidence they're going to struggle to kind of big themselves up when it comes down to or big the results up sorry rather than even big themselves up it's all about the results which they which they deliver it is, it is, and it's it's hugely um, powerful. And I think it's really interesting that in the golf world, there's, yeah, I, I digress slightly because we'll come on to other stuff, but it's interesting that there are some people in the golf world that are now seeing this. Um, there's a really interesting guy called Dan Grieve who, um, he, firstly, you know, he started to get a few clients that you know it, were helping him achieve what he wanted to, but he's now known as the world's greatest short game coach. So he then did a video of Rick Shields, but he's now got all these flame celebrities traveling all over the world to come to his place in Woburn because he's focused on a niche so again goes to some of the things we talk about knows his niche which is the short game it's not more all the other areas but now people are paying him like a thousand quid you know per session or you know they they join a waiting list to join his school because he's so good at that area and the impact it has when they're then going and playing golf is incredible right so it's yeah. it's a similar scenario isn't it it's it's building your, your, your sweet spot and getting people to really want to 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 to, to, to value what they do and, and what's the biggest mistake just before we go to some of the other elements around what's the biggest mistake you see most businesses make with regard to their services or their offering and how they price it yeah well hourly rates or day rates is the most common sort of mistake which i see people making so and it let there's tons of clues out there which point to like why it's you know not the best way to charge so take for example you know imagine if you've got uh, a web, three web designers one who's just starting out and he says right james i'm gonna build you a website i think it'll take me about 20 hours and i'll charge you 50 pounds an hour and you think well oh, 1k okay that seems fair or let's let's give it a shot but what he forgot to tell you was that he hasn't been doing it particularly long so he's not very experienced and doesn't have all the requisite skills or knowledge to be able to build a you know great website that brings you leads in so he comes back three months later because he's under charging and he doesn't know his his you know supply and demand doesn't know his capacity comes back three months later and he's forgotten to put the blog on there in the shopping cart that you asked for right so what happens at this point is um you go well how long is it going to take to add those and he says well it's going to be another 10 hours and you say well hold your horses there chat because we agreed on 20 hours and so we're getting all these clues that hourly rates don't work right uh initially and he reluctantly agrees to do it for free now he's feeling resentful because he's not getting paid what he thinks he should be getting paid and you're feeling resentful because he didn't give you what he promised so you can see that, that right that's clue number one hourly rates don't work the next clue, web designer number two comes along and he's been doing it for years, but he doesn't know what James and Robin know about pricing and sales and things like that. So he's also charging £50 an hour. But because he's been doing it for longer, he's much more experienced, does it so much faster. He's aware of what his capacity constraints are. He He's very technical, so he's got your blog and your shopping cart on there, but it only takes him 10 hours. So why does a guy who's more experienced, does it faster and better, end up getting paid less than the guy who's more inexperienced right so the hourly rates is actually a tax if you think about it for inexperience um so that's our second clue but where it gets really interesting for me is when you introduce web design number three 
imagine web designer number three shows up and she's a website ninja like she's just the the best of the best and she says right james i'm going to build you this website uh, we'll have it live in 72 hours within a month you'll be getting 15 to 20 solid qualified leads for your business and you go mm, that sounds quite compelling on top of that she says if i can't create those results for you in the first 30 days i'll refund you the money and i'll give you a thousand pounds for wasting your time so you can go and spend that on the other two if you want to right she, but she's that confident it but the thing is she then tells you what her prices are and she says well the investment's just 10k and for a lot of people buying a website they'll be like whoa that's that's a lot of money but you or i who are experienced in the business world we go okay, well, this person's given me these guarantees and, you know, talking about results for my business. And I know if I got 15 leads in, well, my conversion rate, you know, I could get one in three conversion rate. I could get five clients a month from this. So all of a sudden, 10K sounds cheap in comparison, like relative to the results which that person can potentially generate for you. But a, a lot of the time, people are, um, they just don't understand what it is that they're actually buying. And that's also reflected, and you must experience this a lot, where people don't fully understand what it is that they're actually selling either. So you got all this confusion in the marketplace where people just kind of winging it, trying to make it, you know, make make a living, basically. Um, the second mistake which I've discovered is uh, along the way is um, discounting. And I, I never... It took, I knew that discounts were bad, but it took me until I met up with an amazing accountant. He worked for the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants. Uh, he was one of the the, the board um, team there. And he, he was like, Robin, I know you talk about discounts, but do you want to go through the numbers? And he, he showed me this chart where the average business that offers just a 5% discount, for example, most people would assume that you've only got to like you know sell five percent more of the same thing to make the same net profit well you don't it's more than that because by the time the money trickles down through your profit and loss account and gets eaten up by overheads this there's this compounding effect which happens so i think this as i hopefully i'm not going to misquote the stats i should probably i should probably have a chart somewhere with these written on but it's something like for a five percent discount you've got to sell 14 percent more of the same product to make the same net profit by the time you get to ten percent, it's about twenty-two percent more of the same product or service to make the same net profit. And it's by the time you get to about twenty-five percent of a discount, you've got to sell virtually double to make the same yeah. net profit, right? So imagine that working twice as hard to make the same money. You know, it it just doesn't make sense. And also the the impression that it gives the other person buying it, which is, oh, I got my way here, so therefore I can negotiate every time I want something, I can get my own way. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. interesting you say, uh, and I, I use a story I put it on a post on LinkedIn this morning about my dad. Um, we were buying my dad a car the weekend. Long story short, we bought two cars. It was about presentation because one guy presented himself in a bit shit and looks it looked crappy. He's, he was like, oh, you know, coming in to see the car. The other guys look professional, whatever else. Anyway, so as, as I am, you know, set, you know, being in sales, I was like, I got to negotiate. I said, my dad, I'll negotiate for you, of course. And you know, went to have this conversation with the you know, the guy, and he was like, "Look, uh, what what you know, what movement have you got on the price?" Just that so, you know, I'm really sorry, I can't move on the price. And I was like, "Okay, well," uh, he said, "Look, the reason being is because we don't make a huge amount of money in these cars. We put a lot of effort into this. I give it my care, I give it my time, in, and actually, if I do that, I'm not going to tell me in the future." And I was like, "I had more respect for the guy, whereas the previous guy." all right, well, I'll do it for this. And it's sort of like you felt like saying, okay, well, how much going to push? So yeah. actually, as a buyer, you actually have more respect for the guy that says, thanks very much, but I'm happy at the price I've got. I know I can sell it at that price. I'm good at what I do. So it's yeah. the impression it gives as much as anything else, as well as all the other th amazing things you've mentioned, doesn't it? Well, it's it's basic supply and demand economics there. So what he's doing in saying, no, I'm comfortable with my value, thank you. This is what the price is. He's controlling supply. He's actually saying that we're not a commodity that we can just discount, stack them high, sell them cheap. Um, we, you know, we're exclusive. And therefore, things that generally are exclusive and there's less of them, it, it you know, it may, it naturally creates more sort of value and it becomes more expensive. And I think a lot of people like, I mean, at a very basic level, like hourly rates, you would think would be the one thing that people wouldn't discount because it is a scarce resource at the end of the day. But I think people underestimate how much time they've actually got available. So like the, the typical sort of, I mean, I primarily work with service client businesses um, now, the, the average uh, service client business owner they think that oh i've got 40 hours of capacity each week because they compare themselves to a job basically oh i can sell 160 hours or 22 days a month of you know my time but the reality is they've forgotten to take into the equation like you know finance admin sales marketing social media and 
meet networking meetings and kids taking days off school and sickly and all the rest of it right so i did a study of what you know way back when when i started sort of pivoting into more service client businesses and we discovered that the average service client business owner typically on the average month works something like 4.8 paid days a month so a quarter of the month is actually into client fulfillment and revenue generating activities so therefore it just an, even a very basic equation, you just have to multiply your prices by four. If you're going to do hourly rates, mul- mul- whatever you think you should be charging, times it by four, right? That, and l- lawyers have this down. Lawyers are like two hundred pounds plus an hour for a partner in a law firm because they know that you know somebody yeah. starting out in law, they'll try and undercut the market and charge fifty pounds an hour, and then very quickly figure out that's not the right way to to charge. And we both know, you know, we we, we both you know people. Ex- talk about this a lot and work with clients on it but it's that fear factor isn't it that people have around about money and it's actually you mentioned earlier on about the money coach and their money background mm-hmm. it's like that fear factor that people have around what they're all that that self element of what they're worth that's you know i, I was with a you know a, a program as we both know that and i was on a call with a, a mastermind call with someone last week and they were like i said to, you know i said to them well, you know what what you what do you think you're worth and he said well you know 30 pounds an hour and i said really i was like wow they said with all your experience and knowledge this is someone that's been in the police i was like 30 pounds an hour that's that's all you know that's all you see yourself as worth i said well do you know that you know weight are paying 15 pounds an hour to deliver meals like when you have all the hassle of running the business so it's quite scary sometimes what people's own value of themselves is isn't it yeah 100 percent. i mean you and i we we see it all the time but all they need is just to see a little glimmer of hope that their their value is is worth well, they just need a, ch- a shift in perspective because that's that thirty pounds an hour is how much they're valuing their time at, but that's not the thing which the person is buying, is it? The outcome we, we always talk about is people buy outcomes, not what you do, right? Yeah, that's it. And but so you ask most service client business owners, like what it what is it that they do? They'll tell you, I'm a web designer, right? So I I build websites. Well no what's what's the outcome of like you building those websites right or or that brand that logo which you design or if you i don't know if you typeset books it doesn't matter what it is take a hr consultant the outcome you get as i said to a lady i spoke to last week the outcome you get is someone's not buying your knowledge they're buying the fact they can put their head on the pillow knowing that the person that they've just let go from their company isn't going to suit them or isn't going to take them to a tribunal or isn't going to that's what you're they're buying they're not buying the actual advice that you give they're buying the the, the, the whole outcome of, of peace of mind and tranquility. And that what's that worth to them? Well, that, you know, if going on a summer holiday in the next six weeks where it could be interrupted all the time, it could be worth thousands, right? Yeah, that's it. That's it. But you have to remember as well that I think, like, they don't teach us about money at school. Well, that yeah. I know, it might have changed a little bit. I'm not, you know, it's about 25 years since I was last at school. Longer than me. <laughs> But they, I mean, from what, you know, my girls are 10 and 8 now, you know, and, and I, they don't come home talking to me about, you know, they do maths, but they don't teach you about value and, and the cost of things and stuff like that. And I think that that is that at the moment kind of prevails, like why I think people really undersell themselves, because nobody out there is actually telling them that they're worth something. I think unless you have entrepreneurial parents who are kind of, you know, and you're you're in and around them all of the time, and those parents are also willing to have the conversations. I assume that just through osmosis, my girls would kind of get like entrepreneurship, like through their DNA and through osmosis. But actually, no, it's taken me to sit down and when they get their little toy checkout out and I start being, you know, uh, touted ice creams and stuff like that, you know, from their little ice cream shop. Um, And then I have a, I'll have a conversation with my eight year old and I'm like, oh, just so it's three pounds for the ice cream. Okay. How much does it cost to make, make it? And she's like, I don't know. Right. Well, let's figure it out. Are you going to buy it from a shop? Are you going to make it yourself? Are you going to, and so we went through just doing a very basic calculation. You know, there's a, there was a, a pound to, to make the stuff, a pound for her time to sell it in her, from her ice cream van and then a pound profit you know just basic stuff like that 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 those thoughts will then start to evolve now as she gets older and it's and like you say you're giving your girls that chance but so many people unfortunately get programmed into this sort of wrong way of thinking don't they and and also the the other thing that frustrates me and i say this to a lot of people at the time is we also they got we also get programmed if you're you know entrepreneurial to think that monday to friday nine to five is your job and outside of that time is not work Whereas actually a little bit like, well, whereas if you love what you do and how you do it, then you don't put time limits on when you do it. It's like, you know, because, you know, you and I know we we can we can have 
Thursday afternoon off if you want Thursday afternoon off because you might do something Saturday morning because you feel better on Saturday morning than Thursday afternoon, right? Well, yeah. do what you need to do to get the result done rather than the elements of, of when you do it. So, uh, I mean, there's some basic maths as well. Like you, don't, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to be able to figure out how much to charge for things. Um, so there's a, a process which I teach people called goal-focused pricing. So imagine that you wanted to earn 100K in the next you know, 12 months. Um, and I go through this quite right. In fact, I had a coach recently where I went through this with them and uh, it's like, right, you want to earn hundred K in the next 12 months. Um, how much do you think about charging for your coaching program? And they said, oh, a thousand pounds. It's like, great. So you've got capacity to be able to deliver a hundred clients this year. And their eyes kind of pops out their head. And I was like, oh, tell me what's going on there. And essentially, first of all, they were like, well, I, one, I, I don't think I can deliver to 100 clients. I was like, okay, well, how many do you think you could support? This is a one-to-one -one coach as well, so quite intensive. And they're like, maybe 20. Okay, so again, we're looking for clues. All you've got to be in business is like Inspector Pluto or Cluso or Miss Marple, right? For dog, as I call it. Just probing, digging, keep digging. That's it. Absolutely. Like, look for the clues. So I was like, okay, so, so you've got a fifth of the capacity. Remember demand and supply? So we've only got a fifth of the supply that we thought that we might need. The second thing was on the demand side of it. She was like, how do, how on earth do I create enough demand for 100 clients? I'm struggling to get like one call a week booked at the moment. Yeah, so that's not going to get me anywhere near to it. So like, okay, so... We've got two problems here working on both sides of it. You don't have the capacity to deliver 100 clients. You don't actually think you can stimulate enough demand through marketing and sales to enroll 100 clients. So we've got to really seriously rethink this. And I said, well, how about how about if there's a, a world in your future where you're charging £5,000 for this program, not £1,000? And again, eyes popped out of her head. And so we went through this really fun sort of experiment where and in fact, if, if you're game, we could potentially do it with you, James. I don't know if you, I think you might have seen me do this before, actually, on, on Shift to Success. So you might know where I'm going with this. But, the, on, but for the purpose of the podcast and for other people, I'll, I'll play game. Play, play along. Okay. So th there is probably like the ultimate, I don't know, sales training program, which you've kind of got in your head that you would love to design and deliver one day in the future um you know uh is have you got an idea of something like that that you've you've yeah, thought about sure. okay yeah, i've got a program i'd like to put in place yeah do you want to share a little bit more information about it sure we'd like to generate a hundred thousand pounds per year from our sales pro trading program which helps people create a sales plan that can help them grow grow growth in their business Okay, so so in terms of what you're going to sort of charge though for the client, have you have you thought about sort of where you might be with that? Yeah, we're thinking at the moment. You know, we probably charge people. I don't know, uh, a thousand pounds. I say for per. Uh, per okay, so simple. you're going to have to you're going to have to. I'm going to set the scene here, James, because I know um, I know you charge significantly more than that for the training which you do. But imagine put you put yourself back into the shoes now of the person who you know you're just starting out. You're at the thousand pound sort of price point. Um, I mean, we can we can go down the hypothetical. We can actually go down the route with something for your business if you want to, James. Oh, let's, do, let's do let's do it specifically then. Okay, so we've got a uh, a, a sales trade. We've got a sales course that we're going to run, um, which is uh, six four nine, which is a group program. So it's okay. a group program where people can join a group every two weeks. Our goal over the course of the next six months, this is me being pretty honest. We've we're launching the program. We've had really good feedback so far on the course. We're probably looking if we can generate two, three k a month. We're happy at that for the time being, and then build that up bit by bit. But um, six four nine is a program. It lasts eight weeks. Is eight parts of the pro. Uh, so of the fixed program. fee for six four nine for eight weeks. Correct. With one of our mentors, basically online to uh, to then deliver the course. Okay. Is is there a world in your future, James, where you could be charging three k for that? Potentially, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe I think we could. Maybe you're right. So, but let's return to, to today because obviously there was a little bit of hesitation there where you're like, oh, maybe, but right now. Maybe so because we want to get it started off and I'd rather, you know, from my perspective, I'd rather get 10 people saying they love the course at 649 and then move the price up. But that's... Okay, so so I, I think that's too cheap. I think I think there's a world here, like immediately, where you could be charging a bit more. Not delivered by me, mind you. It's delivered by my one of my team. Okay, that's, so that's fine. That's fine. I, but they've been trained by you. You're a world class right. sales coach, so you know. Yep. They, and you wouldn't choose somebody if you didn't trust them to do a great job right. and reflect your brand. Okay, so so six four nine. Okay, what if you charged? I don't know, seven fifty for it, or nine hundred, maybe yep. twelve hundred. Yeah, fifteen hundred. Yeah, keep going. Eighteen hundred. Yeah. Two thousand, yep. Two two and a half thousand. I think that's reasonable. Yeah, very reasonable. So what? Well, the, the outcomes that they're going to gain from it, they're going to have a plan that's going to enable them to basically go and hit any number they want. 
so so I don't understand why why you're not charging for that now. Right, well, there you go. Bit of bit of love in the environment, like so. Maybe because, and, and the reason being I've got that is because we've we've priced it at a an audience that we think can't. Yeah, I wouldn't say can't afford that, but we are uh, by as I always say to people, my big mission is I generally try and work with those who are a bit richer to help those that are poorer. And sometimes small businesses generally two and a half k for them can be a bit of an upfront cost to to hit to. But you're right, maybe we need to move that price up. There you go, live coaching on there with me. I'm very well, happy. I'm, I've got, some, I've got something else for you, James, because it might be that I, you've you've kind of given some rationale there behind why you feel it might be a little bit too steep for some people and for this first cohort and you've got some personal goals which you want to achieve for the business as well get those t- first 10 people on but what if there's a compromise you just launched it at 1200 yeah yeah i feel very comfortable doing that and and the other thing to consider as well is like what if you couldn't lose right so i don't know how many people you've got sort of on the wait list for this for example but let's say you've got i don't know 10 conversations or 20 conversations booked or something like that where you're going to be pitching this sort of program you know to these people um if you and i'll make a bet with you right because we've virtually doubled the price there from 649 to 1200 yeah, 1, okay. yeah. um if you speak to 10 people and you can document the process and they all, all the first ten people you speak to about this all say no, and you can prove that to me. I'll buy it at twelve hundred pounds. There you go, even better. Can't go wrong. Right, so. so you can't you can't lose now. Can you see the difference there as well? I mean, we've done we've worked together for a long time, but hopefully you might be able to explain sort of the rationale to people listening to this as well. Can you see the difference there between what's going on in your like intellectually trying to solve this as a pricing problem six four nine ten spots makes it like launch launch it versus heart what's in here your subconscious and your heartfelt is like actually no I know I'm worth more than that and twelve hundred. If I couldn't train, really, it's a really interesting point, actually. And look, it's it's you know we're talking just like, but it, we so we did a we did a soft launch of it. We asked some beta testers to do the launch the program, and it was really interesting. So we asked the lady, I won't say her name because she listens to the podcast, but uh, she said to me, uh, I said, so well, look, what did you think to the, you know we we gave it to them the course because we wanted feedback on the course. We said, what did you think? She said, it was brilliant, loved it, all the elements she put, the component parts. I said, great. I said, tell me what you think it was worth pricing wise, and they and actually. So we've got we have actually got three levels to it. We've got a six four nine, we've got a fifth a, a one five nine nine, which involves the group, but also we've got a three grand that involves me, basically if they want me. And uh, and I said to someone, look, what would you see it costing it? I said, she said, oh, I'd, I'd happily pay. Well, I, she said I paid twelve fifty for a boot camp uh, the year before that was quite specific to her, to her. She's a HR practitioner. I said, well, how did you find that boot camp? She said, it was all right. It was great. It wasn't, I don't think it was quite as good as this. So it's a really interesting point to that point that people are always prepared to spend a bit more than you think if what you can give them makes a difference. The other thing that I also think goes back to that point was also about the level of the service. And I always say to people, if you're selling a, a petty chew, okay, you need a lot, lot of petty chews to sell. But if you're selling a service, which is a thousand pounds a month or 500 pounds a month, whatever else, you don't need that much growth in your business to make the investment that you make in my course or your course or whatever else worthwhile for you whereas yeah. if you're selling 10 pounds an hour then it's harder to justify so because the return on investment is really simple and clear and the third thing i said to them which is the really interesting thing which is why we've been was people don't buy things not because they don't think it's it's not the price but because they don't think it'll work yeah well, actually, if you then remove that element by saying, like you say, as you just said, I give you the guarantee that if you don't do this, I'll give you this at the end of it. You remove that that bar- that final barrier. It makes it so much simpler. Than that. The whole buying decision process just becomes easier, doesn't it? Yeah, that's it. And I apologize to anybody listening. Here. I've just doubled James's price now if you're thinking about buying his program. <laughs> no, it's, it's all good. It's, and I think it, it's just that dynamic. And I think you're right. And I think, and I'm, I'm, as you know, I'm one of these people that always looks at how I do what I do and where I do it because I think you... It's 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 a, it's a challenge for every business owner, even us experienced ones, to to price it. And there's that challenge sometimes, whereby some you might price it, you know. And we've talked. I've gone in. I think I told the story about a, a, a company. I won't say the name again because I I remember going and asking them to give me a presentation. And you had a similar one at York. And my, I remember talking to my wife, and it was based in da- Daventry, I think it was, in an area that I know nothing about. Being honest, it was well, if they're listening to it, then it was on concrete stone. And I was like, what do I know about concrete stone? 
all about concrete stone. I said to my wife, I said, I don't really fancy doing this. She said, I'll just charge a high price. So, of course, I put the rate in. And, of course, they said, yeah, thanks very much. Can we keep it? And you're pretty like, oh, I don't really want to do this. But, <laughs> but then you get the joys of being able to charge a high price to do it, go and do a presentation that you didn't really fancy. So, again, yeah. sometimes that's another great tactic for people, isn't it? If it's someone you're not sure about, if your gut feel isn't there, well, just get going with a higher price. And actually, if they buy it, then then you know that the market is buying at that point. Yeah, that's it. Absolutely. I, and it creates that little bit of tension in the marketplace as well, which I think sometimes you need in order to help people make decisions from a sales perspective. But yeah. you, you touched on something quite interesting. So you talked about sort of service businesses charging on a monthly sort of basis as well. That You've actually got to be quite careful about that because sometimes people can treat that a little bit like a Netflix subscription. Yeah. Um, and I, I noticed this in my early days actually coaching, and I'm, I'm not ashamed to admit this because despite being the fearless business coach, I'm not immune to like bouts of stupidity but it happens um i think in every business um so i used to i used to sign clients up and then i'd let them start paying paying on a monthly basis and it was kind of a fixed monthly fee depending on which package they bought and um i a few months in i was like a scratch my head going i don't understand why i'm not making the money that i feel i should be getting based on the clients i've been signing up and i looked at essentially i was just too nice um despite having contracts and things like that clients would get four months in and then they'd be like they'd either be having a, a riotous time having you know making loads of money and they'd be like i don't need your help anymore rob or maybe things have gone a little bit south in their life or business and yeah. so for whatever reason they decide to cancel um and so my average i have a six month program my average sort of lifespan of a client and because i actually got most of the time it's because i got great results for clients it was like 4.6 months so i was losing 1.4 months worth of revenue on average per client um because they were treating it like a netflix subscription that they could just cancel any point so yeah. the couple of things which i implemented very early on actually this is like year one of coaching you know my coaching business um uh, two things one was contracts and agreements and but also you've got to be of the mindset to actually back it up you know if you're going to have a, an agreement which states this is how much the person's got to pay um and provided you keep your side of the agreement you you've got to be prepared to chase the money or just it be a lost cause if you don't want to but co- contracts and agreements um it's more so about getting the client to sign it because when the client signs a bit of paper they're making a commitment to themselves that they're on this journey no matter you know what comes up basically but the second thing was um i think more important than that was the st- structuring the payment so let's say for example if you had like a 3k coaching package or whatever it was service package you wouldn't just and it was six months you wouldn't just take the 3k and divide it by six because that's that netflix model that somebody th- despite it's i know it's not five pound 99 a month but it's it's a monthly thing so what you do instead is you inflate an upfront fee fee which kind of locks them in there's generally more work involved at the front end of most services anyway that are delivered um and then you ratchet down the rest of it so like on a 3k program you might do 1500 up front and then five installments of 300 for example and the nice thing is that well the the client's committed you know they're committed and because they spent some money on this they're going to be doing whatever they can to protect their investment you would hope the service providers now all in as well they've got skin in the game because they've collected that money up front they've got more time now to get stuck in and deliver some great results for the clients and if the client does get to like 4.4 months into the program well they've actually spent most of their money so they kind of go oh well i should probably see it through anyway in for a penny and for a pound i think yeah that, that's it um and generally it's those last few months actually where the result kind of sticks so you know, most services, there's always three phases of work. Again, you might have experienced this as well with a lot of your clients, but you have the, the beginning of it. This I call it, it's, it's the AIM acronym, AIM. Assessment up front, you know, to get the work started and to get to know one another and things like that. Then you go into an implementation phase where you're kind of the big breakthroughs and the learnings and the insights happen and the big, you know, um, changes, transformations generally happens. But then you have this great bit at the end of it, the last month or two, which is like the maintenance phase. And I think people under value you know what goes into that or or the lasting impact that that maintenance phase can have because implementation is one thing but if you don't then build up habits around whatever created that transformation through maintenance you're not going to learn and you're going to go back to old habits so the three phases are really important so if you sell a program you've got to get people through to the end otherwise they don't it doesn't you don't get the long lasting results that's and that's the challenge that we all know it's the challenge and and it's it's also the human behavior dynamic i mean i saw you know there's a 
Yeah, we're both adv- advocates of courses and buying courses and developing our own learning. And, you know, but we've both, I'm sure, been, I've certainly been on courses where I've been on it and implemented, loved the ideas, had a great feeling and feedback on the course, but didn't implement some of the stuff ultimately because that's, and then you go back after us and you go back after us. Why didn't I buy that course? It was because I wanted to achieve this outcome and I'm not achieving it. It's not because of their fault. It was just because I didn't apply myself or do the elements alongside it. So, and that's the challenge for a lot of people, isn't it? A lot of businesses is, is getting their clients to implement what they say and, and to make sure that they go and follow through and complete the job. So have you got any advice where you've, you know, where you've you know, had clients in that position where you've said, right, how can you ensure that their clients do finish off the, the bit that they've said they would to get the, the outcome that they wanted at the start? Normally it's because I got to be, I have to just figure out how to best articulate this. So I just, just blurt it out and be honest about it. Normally it's because service providers do too many things for too many different types of people. Yeah. Uh, so they're not not specialists, and what they end up doing is they end up confusing their clients with too many different things. Um, like uh, again, I can give a personal example of this. So um, when I first started out, I was probably I was working in lots of different areas of people's businesses, and because I'd run a marketing agency, it was assumed that people, you know, a lot of the questions which I got were around marketing. And like, let's face it, marketeers are ten a penny these days, right? And I got out of the marketing game for a reason, um, which I won't go into all of the details, the ins and outs of it now. But um, I, if I loved marketing, I'd still be doing it. But I just didn't. I didn't wasn't as that passionate about spending all of my work, you know, waking hours in marketing. As I evolved my coaching program and realized that pricing, the productization, and a bit of sales skills. When I focused on those three things and left the marketing and the finance and the HR and all of the other bits of like business I could help people with out my results like just skyrocketed they just went you know because I just focused on the things which I I had figured out how to create the biggest impact in the shortest period of time with clients every and every time and occasionally you get kind of drawn back into stuff you always get pulled into people ask questions you always get pulled back into it every time I've kind of dipped my toe back into that those sort of spaces outside of that I've kind of been caught out a little bit and burnt so I've learned the hard way just no no focus on what you do best and what creates the biggest impact but that's because then because you're only working on like three things say with a client over the course of a period of several months or a couple of years or whatever um you know that you're just drilling it into them you're building up muscle memory in those three areas and like i said the pricing stuff when somebody gets the pricing stuff with the way that we teach it they can't earn unlearn that it's like if if they like in your business once they know the sales skills and they're able to go out and do deals they can go and get a job anywhere doing sales, even if their business doesn't work out, for example, or whatever. Like there are certain skills in in business in in the job market which are invaluable once you know them. I can agree more, and it's like I always say for in, in my in our area, certainly specifically, I say you know the robots. Whilst robots are doing some incredible things, and AI is you know t- going to take over the world in time, I still think we'll be the last profession standing because the fact that a human to human connection and the ability to read someone and engage what they're thinking and see what they're not thinking and that whole process will will be the last thing that a robot can do in the same way as they can do right now. But it will happen, I'm sure. There'll be robots in time will do it, but the ability to be human and connect with people, which is what sales is is all about, will take will take time. So um but it's been brilliant to chat to you. We've got, you know, five more minutes just to to you know and so many insights you've shared. And I'm glad that we've not talked about the sales stuff in a way because it's sort of it's actually your area of your area of knowledge and well, of course it's in multiple areas, but it's this aspect of people getting their value for what, what they do. What just before before we you know before we say well, why do you think it is though that people have such a bad perception of sales and selling as well because you talk about outcomes and the results but there is and you know and i know it, there is this horrible people feel a bit ooh and cheesy about sales and the why why it is well why do you think people feel like that way and, and how can you know we're in the same sort of similar cap how can we continue to to make people feel that it's not that way well i mean the, the obvious the obvious answer is like the the you know the window sales double glazing salesman the car salesman things like that it's like people's perceptions but um it's actually i think at a, a very you know in business at a psychological level a lot of the people are trying to sell for the wrong reasons so they're trying to sell because they want to put food on their table and pay their mortgage i'm pointing over there because my house is over there right but um and yeah we've all got to earn a living we've got families to look after and things like that but 
I, and I always have to say this out of Mrs. Waite's earshot, by the way, but I would rather be poor, homeless and destitute than take somebody's money for my own ends. I, I want I want them to buy into what I do because of the amazing results they're going to get and how much of a difference it's going to make to their business and their lifestyle. Money for me is a natural byproduct of that. And you should you should never have to aggressively persuade somebody to buy your products. And I, I like deep down, I believe that. And when I talk about sales in with my community, you know, with the fearless crew, it's very much from a yeah, results based holistic approach, making sure that the client is getting the best possible outcome for them. Even if that means because sales isn't just about getting a yes sales is also about like being open to like putting no on the table because it's not best fit that's yeah. a good salesperson in my eyes who's willing to walk away from a deal i couldn't agree more and i talk to people about three three methods to sell you know you know deliver it what you know what i call fuck them and duck them which is you sell them but you duck the shit that comes back your way deliver a disappointment which is you meant well but you didn't deliver or transform and tribe and if you can actually transform someone's life and build that you'll build this tribe of people that are literally talking behind you that saying how good you are they'll be your biggest ambassadors and that you know all the people that you know that will sell your you and your company without even telling them they'll be able to ask them because they're because you've made a difference in their world and it's made such a factor and you're right i love what you said there because you i couldn't agree more it's like what are you doing if this is just to service your own pocket just because you want to get rich just because you want to do something then people will see through that mm. and like the, the coaching space unfortunately i mean i know there's other industries that experience this but at the moment it seems there's this big shiny like instagrammable like seven figure scaling coach b and it's all bullshit quite frankly like they, they're doing that just so they can kind of you know flex a little bit and look big and you know hey look at me i'm so smart in my ferraris and stuff like that um and then you go and check out their reviews and you're like oh god they're actually treating their customers really badly and i think i think um you know there are so many different options in in every niche market sector out there at the moment like i'd all with any business owner go and do your research go and speak to at least three of whatever service it is that you're thinking about buying go and read the, all of the reviews not just on google but trust pilot and facebook and go go and see if they've got any genuine video testimonials from like happy customers on their website like spend like i always say with people that you want to hire slow and fire fast it's the same with service providers take your time to find the right one and in the moment you get the ick from whatever it is that you're experiencing do be prepared to let them go and find another one obviously contractually you know contracts aside um because i think if you if you just buy into something because it looks all shiny and everything it's like there's there's normally nothing beneath that surface level all, 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 as i still say all, all fur coat and no knickers certainly but uh but is the case as we see with a lot of people but look yeah i've learned mate, it's been absolutely brilliant to chat to you and thank you so much incredibly generous of your time and look i've always you know recommend you've got your two books your uh online business uh, which is your first book which is yeah. um which is a great book but also take your shot as well so um what i'm going to do as well is if anyone uh registers uh we'll put a link in the in the podcast uh first three people to to put to register well, I'll, I'll buy a copy of robin's book take a shot i know he gives them out but i'll make sure he's got some he's compensated for them it's a brilliant book and and, and advocates all of the things that you've talked about today so and i really encourage people to to read it and um i know where can people where's the best place for people to reach you if they want to reach out to you connect with you on linkedin or i know you are all, all over all socials but where's the best place for you for yeah to connect? Link, linkedin's the best best place go and go and uh, drop me a connection request and a and a message um a voice note if you can i always like a, a good personalized voice note and i always reply to them as well I think sometimes there's a lot of podcast guests out there who don't do their own socials, but sadly, I, I actually enjoy that side of my business, getting involved in direct messages and speaking to like conversing with people. So um, it's one of my favorite bits. So yeah, LinkedIn uh, or the website, robinwaite.com. Brilliant. Well, look, thank you so much. And I, you know, as I say, for anyone listening to this, Robin's a, a brilliant guy. His his knowledge and insights on on like so many areas of business are incredible, especially around um, what we talked about today, around pricing, around mindset, around getting the value for what you and your business is worth. So, um, look, I couldn't encourage you more than to go and have a have a chat to him, have a have a listen to him. So he's got also got a group on Facebook and lots of areas where you share your insights. And um, look, um, as I say, lots of people have, have found your stuff valuable. It's why we do what we do to keep on um, in, helping people and making an impact in the world so thank you so much for giving me your time today mate and um, for all the stuff that you continue to do it's amazing that's it my pleasure thank you